Thank you very much, Lisa Allen, for such a fantastic introduction. Good morning and welcome to everybody uh, to today's first session, uh, which is Socioeconomic Change and Transformation in the Yatrafo Center. My name is Lenka, uh, Lenka Šmalish. I'm a PhD student at Durham. I'm a member of the last cohort of the Leverhulm doctoral program in visual culture. I focus on, his, on the history of domestic health, women and nationalism in late 18th and early 19th century Bohemia. And today I'm uh, very excited to leave the history a bit and learn something more about current issues and um, current issues related to visual culture today. Uh, so I hope uh, we all are fresh and ready to open uh, the, today with a cozy morning session. We will have two presentations followed by uh, 15 minutes uh, for questions and answers. Please keep, as Lisa uh, I mentioned, keep your questions coming. <laughs> and um, uh, in the session, the Q and A session, we will have uh, also space for you to raise your hand and ask questions in person. And now I'm um, more than delighted to introduce you Sam Holleram. Uh, he's currently a PhD researcher in media and communications at the University of Melbourne. Uh, he's examining public participation in the reimagination of urban cemeteries as part of the DEATH research team. Today, Sam will be presenting, presenting on tracking visual overload in the built environment. Sam, the stage is yours. Great, I'm happy to be here. Um, yes, I won't be speaking about cemeteries today. Uh, I will be speaking about something else entirely. Um, can everyone see my screen okay? Great. Um, so uh, yeah, before I kick things off, I'd like to say greetings from Melbourne, Australia, uh, where it's six in the evening. And because I'm gonna be speaking about cities, I'd like to say that the city that I'm standing in right now is the unceded ground of the Wurundjeri people the traditional custodians of this land. So I'd like to pay my respects to their elders, both past and present. Um, in my discussion, I'll be talking about this idea of visual overload in cities or the kind of uh, visual clutter that is um, very much present in cities and the debates around visual clutter, visual oversaturation, and some of the kind of historical narratives that were meant to regulate the surfaces of the city, particularly advertising surfaces. Um, it's built on ongoing research into how visual pollution has been defined, measured and controlled. And it's also something that I think is a sort of interesting prehistory to the smart city, the kind of conversations very much out there today. Um, I'll have these three kind of touchdown points where I'll be speaking from. The first one being the mid 19th century crackdown on broadsheets broad sheets and bill stickers in London. The second is the installation of Litfas columns in uh, Berlin and many other European cities. And the third is an uh, example from this century, the 2007 uh, Le Cidage Limp from Sao Paulo, or the Clean City Law that basically outlawed um, almost all uh, outdoor advertising in Sao Paulo, the largest city in the Southern Hemisphere. So when films are pointing to the future, whether they're kind of utopian or dystopian, uh, they are often showing advertising that pervades every surface, uh, even when other government services have kind of crumbled away. Uh, Blade Runner, of course, is like the, you know, number one example of this. Uh, but it's also in, in many other films. And uh, we sort of created this, this corporeal language to talk about this, like infobesity or the um, advertising surfaces of the city as skins, this uh, corporeal notion of, of what the city is like and how it's being kind of burdened by ads or ads are appearing like plankton on a whale. Uh, there's also increasing fears and this is where it gets into the smart city a little bit, that uh, seeing and sensing are going to actually come into one. This is something that uh, you're already seeing in films like Minority Report from 2002, where these ads are, are coming and talking to the protagonist, uh, Tom Cruise, who's on the run. There's also an issue that's come in kind of more recently with the uh, uh, new prevalence of media facades and the idea of protecting the, uh, the, sense in, the senses of urban citizens and, and 
uh, advocating for a public sphere in which people can uh, go about their business without being intruded on by uh, overstepping advertisements, or in this case, uh, illuminated advertisements or animated advertisements. Um, and this is something that's also come to the fore with uh, kind of new street furniture and these new urban innovations. This is Link NYC, but there's also Link UK, these new kind of steli that sit in the street and uh, provide valuable government, valuable services like free Wi-Fi and phone calls, but uh, that is driven by advertising. So measuring the intrusion of Lumen advertising touches on a lot of issues. It touches on urban ecology, uh, it touches on bird flight, it touches on the uh, conceptualization of the night of darkness and the sort of psychology and well-being of city dwellers, uh, and that's both city dwellers, human and non-human. So while I won't talk about it today, there is actually quite a bit of scientific literature about uh, birds, raccoons, toads, other uh, nocturnal animals that are, are kind of um, yeah, thrown off by illumination in cities. The first point where I'll touch on is the bill stickers of London. Uh, so in 1850s London, there was this scourge of disfigurative work uh, of the bill stickers, of the kind of advertisements that went all over the city. Uh, this is written about in a book by Henry Sampson called The History of Advertising from the Earliest Times. And Sampson says that, you know, there was a period not long ago when walls were reserved for proclamations and announcements. There was a clear hierarchy. Uh, the government, the church, the other civic uh, leaders, they kind of divide walls into strict placements and you knew where things would go. But this epidemic of new bill sticking actually threatened the rule of law and the legibility of urban space. Um, sorry. And so actually the bill stickers in some ways, uh, they are very reminiscent of graffiti writers in New York City in the wild style heyday of the 1970s, where they're, uh, you know, sticking over each other, they're organized into crews and they're actually competing to see who can be the king of a particular neighborhood. Um, so it's this interesting uh, kind of allusion to a, a phenomenon that will happen five decades later, sorry, 15 decades later. Um, and part of this is driven by typographic invasion. There's, there's a, this is all pre-lithography um, and all of the kind of points that are being made, all the products that are being sold are being sold in um, this like uh, extremely bombastic typography made from uh, new cuts of, of uh, letters, so-called circus type. And um, also this kind of, uh, this plankton in the walls is developing into what one contemporary writer calls word sludge smeared across the facades. This is John Orlando Perry's famous uh, London street scene in which uh, only the top of St. Peter's is visible and everything else is this word sludge. Uh, Paris is a bit of the same story. I won't actually go too much into that. Um, this is a, the first female bill sticker in, in France, but she's actually sticking up her bills at the time when um, bill sticking is becoming less and less common or of this kind of free variety. It's really been reined in and between, by the end of the 19th century, London and Paris have really professionalized advertising. So they've effectively banished these itinerant bill stickers and they've set up contracted advertisement hoardings. Uh, and so the communally held services of the city are, are, are privatized. They're, they're uh, leased out to these ad companies and with that, you also see a shift in the way the surfaces are, are uh, understood. So what was perceived as a nuisance is uh, very quickly reframed as a net gain to property owners. So while you have people talking about how uh, disgusting and unwholesome this uh, postering is, by the end of the century, people are talking about how they can actually monetize it themselves, how they, if they have a house that looks out on a main thoroughfare or a newly built train line, can actually become the purveyors of ads and can put their surfaces to work for money. Um, so a quote from that from Samson is, the private walls, even in fashionable localities, might become well papered by the hand of the advertiser. 
Uh, so we'll move on now to Litfast Columns. Uh, this was came to the news relatively recently because the city of Berlin has begun to uh, remove the old columns and replace them with new standardized backlit models. Um, there's this wheat paste campaign by an artist uh, against this um, this movement and and you know calling into question whether the uh, the city needed to get rid of these uh, very iconic columns that become not just a kind of their Berlin icon, but all across uh, Central Europe, they're an icon of urban life. Um, this is a sort of uh, cherished part of the streetscape. And uh, it was really part of the, the fin de siècle public sphere in cities like Berlin, Vienna, and Paris. Uh, Liedfaust is maybe the most famous of the, the originators of these columns. In, in France, it would be the Morris column. Um, I believe in the UK too. Litvast was a kind of master promoter of his columns with the Prussian state. Uh, and the Prussian state was a, a willing kind of, um, willing to work with Litvast because they saw the utility in uh, being able to channel advertisement and speech into these columns. So um, they could actually have a tighter grip on what people were saying about the state and what people were posting. Um, so at first, actually, they were meant to be multi-use columns containing a water pump or maybe a urinal, but they, in the end, don't really have that. Um, they also accommodate larger posters, and those posters can be directly in the, uh, the sight lines of the passerby. So uh, posters are, are communicating with pedestrians in a way that they never have before. Um, and that's also actually creating a kind of poster revolution in both Berlin and Paris, where uh, along with new advances in lithography, there's this kind of momentary uh, art poster renaissance, which happens uh, based in large part because of the visibility of these posters and a kind of shift in the way that advertising is imagined, where it's no longer a nuisance, but it's a kind of interesting thing for the connoisseur, the collector, to encounter these posters in the street. Um, so I think I'll leave, the, I'll leave Europe now and move on for the sake of time to this century and to Sao Paulo with the clean city law. Uh, in the intervening period between the poster Renaissance and uh, the clean city law, there is actually one of the biggest threats to the legibility of the city and that is graffiti. Uh, graffiti is like the only thing that really comes about to truly threaten the grip of advertising on the spaces of, of the surfaces and substrates of our cities. Uh, this is an article from 1980 in the New York Times uh, that responds both to graffiti and to advertising. And um, one of the, the kind of, the, the idea that the writer is floating is that maybe actually we should get rid of both advertising and graffiti in one fell swoop. Um, and there is a city that tried that. And that's Sao Paulo in the beginning of this century, where visual pollution really kind of uh, became a huge public issue there. Both the visual pollution of advertising, which is seen to obscure the historic facades of the city, but also the visual pollution of graffiti. Um, so the crackdown on both of them actually happened together. Uh, the Clean City Law was accompanied by um, some very hard anti-graffiti initiatives. Uh, and it left a lot of these kind of surfaces that were completely empty. The, the law was enforced extremely uh, strictly within, I think, 90 days of its issuance in 2007. All of these surfaces were painted over, awnings and marquees were ripped down, and it left this sort of ghost city of abandoned, sur of, of blank surfaces, as you can see here in Marika Schumann's photos. And what's interesting is that there is a, a kind of moment now where advertising is starting to creep back into the city of Sao Paulo. And it's actually happening in the form of murals uh, and these kind of co-branded street art murals. So um, graffiti has been wiped away, but graffiti uh, borrowing murals uh, like this have actually been sponsored by multinational corporations. This one is actually by GE. Um, and you can't see in this photo, but 
at the bottom of this mural, you, you're kind of led down to the GE logo. So all three of these debates really point to uh, cities' continued reliance on advertising as a way to pay for infrastructure. Um, <coughs> excuse me, that's something that's developed with the hoardings in London, but has really never stopped since then. The tension between the kind of spectacle that's expected in high street areas versus the, the sort of irritation that city dwellers feel from over the top visual stimuli and the cobbled together regulatory response and bodies that have advocated for uh, the protection of the city's surfaces. In the case of Sao Paulo, this is a weird merger of uh, left-wing urbanists and a right-wing government who pushed through the clean city law. In the case of other cities, it has been um, very much the kind of work of activists and sometimes vigilante citizens groups that have torn down advertisements and, uh, and painted over graffiti. Um, so this kind of brings us to some questions and, and I'll, leave, I'll leave it with the questions, which is, is it possible to regulate the urban visual density without going too far? What, you know, what is the balance? What is the uh, medium that we're trying to, uh, to affect? And can a variety of different um, visual actors, whether it's sanctioned ads, unsanctioned graffiti, public messaging from the city, successfully share the spaces of the city? Uh, so with that, I'd like to thank you all. And um, I think I can stop sharing now. Thank you very much, Sam. It was absolutely fascinating. And it's a topic really which relates very closely to our everyday, everyday lives. So fantastic. Thank you very much. And I would like to invite audience to prepare your questions and comments or an perhaps answer to the questions that Sam just asked, uh, open the discussion for, at the end um, uh, of this session.